Hi, my name is Mark Banaka, and I will be interviewing uh, Dr. Linkoff, who is the uh, PI of the SELECT trial, and Dr. Verma, the first author of a really important sub-analysis that is being presented at the American Heart Association 2024 and simultaneously published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So I want to first welcome uh, Drs. Linkoff and Verma uh, to the interview. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, we're, we're so grateful to have uh, this important piece of data to help uh, guide the care of such a high-risk population. And so maybe for the listeners, uh, Dr. Linkoff, you could tell us a little bit about uh, select the overall trial and some of the key findings. Sure. So GLP-1 receptor agonists have been known to be cardioprotective in, in the setting of diabetes, but in addition to glycemic control, these agents also result in substantial loss of weight. And so the question was whether or not in patients who had overweight or obesity but did not have diabetes, whether the cardio excess cardiovascular risk associated <clears throat> could be reduced with GLP-1. So the trial randomized 17,604 patients to receive placebo or semaglutide. And the dose used with a dose escalation was the weight loss dose, the 2.4 milligrams once weekly subcutaneously, and then followed them for cardiovascular events. Patients were entered in the trial if they had overweight or obesity, so BMI of greater than 27, and if they had established cardiovascular disease. So it was a secondary prevention paper study with either primary prior, prior uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, or, or symptomatic PAD. <coughs> Pardon me. So we found overall over a, 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 th a mean of 39, almost 40 months of follow-up, that uh, the risk of, of the MACE endpoint, the cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, was reduced by 20% from 8.0 to 6.5% uh, uh, with uh, concordant reductions in uh, all of the major subgroups that we looked at and substantial reductions in myocardial infarction. Cardiovascular death did not reach significance, but overall mortality was reduced um, and a number of other cardiovascular endpoints. And so the, and the safety profile was very, very good, very reassuring in this group of patients. There was no increase in serious adverse events. There was a higher rate of discontinuation due to GI intolerance uh, with semaglutide, usually during the dose escalation period, but overall very safe and none of the major um, uh, side effects that people have been concerned about did we see in this largest and longest database of patients uh, treated with semaglutide. Well, well, thank you and congratulations to you and all of the investigators because SELECT was truly a landmark trial. I remember almost a year ago or just about a year ago. And, exactly. you know, I think since then, many of us in the clinical domain have wondered sort of, you know, how does this apply to my patient? What does it look like in specific populations? And that's where I think the current analysis is so important. So, doc Dr. Verma, you, you, know, you are a, a cardiac surgeon. I mean, you see patients who have bypassed before, after, and follow up, and so on. So, you know a lot about this population. Can you can you tell us a little bit about why you selected this subgroup, um, you know, for presentation at AHA and for this publication? Well, well, thank you, Dr. Bonaka. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to say a big thanks to you and to the journal and to the ACC for, for really handling our paper in such an expeditious fashion. And, you know, uh, this has become uh, the sort of norm at Jack ever since, uh, you know, uh, uh, of recent, we had a similar experience at the ESC. And I just wanted to say that, you know, Dr. Linkoff and I, the entire steering committee is very, very grateful for how uh, you've handled this paper so expeditiously. So thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, several reasons why we selected this population. Uh, one, I'm a cardiac surgeon, so it's directly relevant to my practice. Uh, two, there are uh, very limited data in, in people, uh, you know, post cabbage with respect to secondary prevention. And most of our insights around, you know, secondary prevention strategies uh, in this high risk group have come from really uh, sort of sub-analyses of larger trials, or you know, oftentimes these sub-analyses are not reported. We know that cabbage patients are included in the ASCVD group, but very few trials have actually tried to report their outcomes uh, distinctly. So, you know, in many ways, uh, the cardiac surgeons uh, don't really see the larger ASCVD uh, trials to be relevant to them directly unless a cabbage-specific subgroup is published. So one reason for doing this is also to enhance sort of knowledge translation within secondary prevention in, in, this, uh, in this cohort. Second is we know that recurrent events continue to accrue in people post cabbage. And part of that is because of progression of native disease. The other is because of graft failure. 
but we know that cabbage is a sort of prototypical example of high-risk ASCVD patients. And therefore, that was even, you know, another reason to, to choose this population. And, and third is that, you know, surprisingly in the, in the post-cabbage cohort, there appears to be a, a significant ongoing unsettled debate about the so-called quote-unquote obesity paradox and you know there's there's data that suggests that obesity may be protective in the context of post cabbage patients uh, there's also data that suggests that weight loss may actually be harmful you know uh, and, and therefore you know understanding uh, the efficacy of glp1 receptor agonists in this population the effects of weight loss uh, in, in post cabbage patients was all relevant so those were some of the reasons why we thought uh, evaluating uh, this cohort would be important. Well, thank you. That you know, very, very important insights. It is interesting that um, you know cabbage is certainly a marker of of you know a, a large degree of athro burden, but in some ways, you know, you might think because they've been so completely revascularized that that some of that risk would would uh, would be less. But tell us a little bit about your findings. How did the cabbage patients in select do relative to those who who hadn't had cabbage? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll get started and then hand, hand it over to uh, Professor Linkoff. Um, you know, so first and foremost, given the fact that we had enrolled 17,604 ASCVD patients, gave us a chance to uh, look at the, uh, you know, a sizable number of people post-cabbage. So I'd like to just remind our viewers that, you know, uh, we, we did not have sort of the history of the timing of index cabbage, uh, you know, and that is, of course, one of the limitations. But uh, we had over 2,000 individuals who had had a prior history of coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So really, it's it's probably one of the largest cohorts of, uh, you know, uh, post-cabbage patients in a sort of pharmacological secondary prevention study that has been evaluated. And when we compared uh, uh, post-cabbage patients to people, uh, you know, the, the rest of the cohort uh, uh, of participants that did not have a history of prior bypass surgery, you know, uh, some things were, were different as expected. You know, the age was slightly higher. A few risk factors were higher. Uh, but, you know, uh, interestingly, LDL cholesterol levels were, were similar. Background therapy was actually uh, uh, significantly uh, higher in this population, maybe reflecting the fact that they had, you know, uh, more athro burden than, you know, the rest of the cohort. Uh, but, uh, you know, what was very interesting, uh, Dr. Bonaka was the fact that the placebo event rates uh, compared to the uh, patients who did not have cabbage, uh, you know, fully adjusted were uh, considerably higher. Uh, the placebo event rate for MACE was, you know, 1.46, for example, in people who had had a history of cabbage versus those who did not. And uh, the placebo event rates for CV death, all cause mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, were, were in the same realm of one and a half to two. Uh, uh, compared to people without a history of cabbage. And, and that just is a, is a very important reminder that uh, patients following bypass surgery, uh, you know, uh, are at significant uh, risk of recurrent uh, ischemic events, heart failure, and mortality. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is a reason why we need to find solutions for, for this, this population. Uh, any, anything to add, Dr. Linkoff? Yes, for the and, and as you pointed out, the as you the, the efficacy, of course, in the patients with with uh, uh, semaglutide was similar, same hazard ratio. Actually, numerically better hazard ratio, but no no variability, no uh, heterogeneity by by statistical testing. And of course, because the event rates were higher in the placebo group, the absolute risk reduction was higher. And I think that's that's a key issue in, in identifying patients who are going to sort of get the most bang for the buck. Right. So, you know, uh, higher risk, higher reward. Well, well, nicely, nicely presented. I know it's a complex analysis, but I think a really sobering reminder that when you see a patient in the clinic who's had a cabbage at any time and they look well, maybe they're asymptomatic that they are at such, you, you had said over 40% higher risk of MACE and I think almost an 80% excess in CV death. So they're not low risk. Um, and, and what you said about the um, treatment was semaglutide. So not only was it effective overall, and select it was consistent in this subgroup, but because of the risk of greater absolute benefit. So I think that's really, uh, really exciting. Um, any trade off for safety? Was the safety the same in this group too? Yeah, the, the safety, in fact, you know, AEs and SAEs were, if, if anything, numerically fewer 
uh, it, with semaglutide versus placebo, of course, there were more uh, uh, gastrointestinal side effects that led to discontinuation, and that is consistent with the entire sort of trial. Um, interestingly, uh, patients uh, who had a history of cabbage uh, lost a little bit less weight than people who did not have cabbage. And, you know, I think that just goes uh, back to the ongoing thesis that the degree of weight loss does not necessarily parallel the degree of ischemic benefit. Well, thank you for raising that. Is this, I was going to ask you that exact question, is this all weight loss or are there direct vascular benefits of semaglutide? Is this a vascular drug? This is a, a multi, multi-organ multi drug. Um, we're in the process of finalizing the analysis that will be sort of the mediation of, of the weight loss versus the cardiovascular outcome. Uh, John Deanfield presented in abstract form this, this uh, data, and it, it, it's very clear that little, if any, of the cardiovascular treatment effect can be explained by changes in weight. Um, and, and, it's, and the effect is uniform across baseline weights. Uh, there may be some predictive value of the changes in waist circumference, which is actually a better measure of adiposity than just weight itself. But the majority, no matter how you look at it, is it can't be explained by changes in intermediate risk factors with the drug. Well, that's that's so exciting. So truly novel therapy. Well, you know, I, I know we don't have a um, a lot of time left, but I did want to spend some time on the implications. So, you know, do, is this now, um, you know, for all of our patients who who met the select criteria of the history of cabbage, should we be thinking about this? And and if yes, then I, I'd like to ask you both to comment on sort of how, how do we implement it then? I mean, we know that, um, you know, when patients go through bypass surgery, they they see a variety of different practitioners. If they have comorbid diabetes, they see endocrinologists too. Who's, uh, whose job is it then, if this is uh, to be high up in the priority list, whose job is it to, to get this to patients? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, what this trial showed is it's the first therapy directed at weight loss in a group of patients with overweight and obesity specifically to reduce cardiovascular events. So that's the first trial ever to show this. And so it now makes uh, overweight and obesity a risk factor that we can modify. And it is, I think it should take its place just as lipids and hypertension in, in as the responsibility of the cardiovascular specialists. And so, you know, in as in many ways, it's um, it's an easier approach in these patients with overweight and obesity than diabetes, say, t- for us to start with, because we don't have to worry about the interactions between other uh, gly- anti-glycemic you know, me- control medications. So we don't have to take the responsibility, so to speak, for the hemoglobin A1C as, as you know, so it, as we would in patients with diabetes. So I think this is a, a group of patients that that we as cardiologists and cardiac surgeons can can uh, aggressively uh, and proactively begin to apply the therapy in those who met the criteria, which is fairly broad criteria. And, and Dr. Verma, so then, um, you know, how do you see this sort of playing out? I mean, you know, there's the, the immediate post-cabbage period, there's a lot going on, and then there are transitions of care. Is this a, an endocrine consult? Is this for the outpatient cardiologist? Or is the cardiac surgeon going to, you know, start to recommend, um, you know, this type of therapy for the, for the post-cabbage patient? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. You know, I think it all begins with first having uh, data like this, right? So having data like this will hopefully trickle itself into, you know, secondary prevention guidelines for cardiac surgeons. So, you know, hopefully it will be at least part and parcel of the cardiac surgery vernacular moving forward. You know, it will get their attention. Uh, Whether that trickles down to the cardiac surgeons, you know, having a discussion with patients and then you know, maybe having a discussion with a referring cardiologist, I think that will probably be the starting point. Uh, but, you know, right now, if, you know, the vast majority of cardiac surgeons, I would I would argue, are likely unaware of the benefits of semaglutide uh, on secondary prevention. And, and if they were aware, they may just say, this doesn't apply to my patients. So I think this will help start the conversation uh, and make them more aware. Uh, I think it needs, you know, more sort of uh, amplification and knowledge translation, similar to what we're doing today. And then I think, uh, you know, uh, I certainly would not be suggesting an endocrine consult. So whether it's the cardiac surgeon or the cardiologist or the family physician, you know, um, when uh, this trial was meant to be a trial of people living with overweight or obesity, but without diabetes, it does not cause hypoglycemia. This is an anti-atherosclerotic strategy. Uh, and just like we're comfortable using statins and dual antiplatelet therapy 
and other strategies for secondary prevention, this is uh, yet another tool to reduce this quite significant residual risk. And, and, and what I really want to highlight for, for our viewers is that this excess risk or hazard of, you know, 40, 50 percent or even the risk of heart failure that is, you know, a hazard ratio of 2.2 or so, you know, that is in the face of a contemporary well-treated population of people with, you know, reasonably well-controlled LDLs with high dose statins in most cases with good blood pressure control. So, you know, the res residual ischemic risk is real and we don't have a lot of tools in people living with overweight and obesity to reduce risk by, by this magnitude. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, victory has a thousand parents as they say, and, you know, whether it's the cardiac surgeon or the cardiologist or the family doctor, I think this is an easily identifiable group, right? You don't have to calculate any risk score. You don't have to, you know, uh, think about it too much. You've had a sternotomy incision, you've had prior bypass surgery, and this therapy can, can you know, uh, extend your life and reduce uh, major morbidity and mortality. One wonderful summary. Well, I want to I want to thank you both for your time today and for you know doing this really important sub analysis. I think certainly very helpful in the clinical domain. Any any um, final comments you want to make before we conclude the interview? It, I just again, I think this emphasizes the importance of uh, we have now for the first time an evidence based therapy in in these this group of patients with overweight and obesity, and I, I can't emphasize. I can't overemphasize how important I think we as cardiologists and also uh, uh, primary care who take care of these patients need to take this on as a, as a, a, a new approach, another pillar of our preventive therapy. Well, thank you both for your time today. Um, you know, congratulations on the AHA presentation and this publication. And Jack, we're grateful to have this uh, information in the public domain. And uh, thanks to all of our listeners. 